The idea behind the concept of biomimicry is that nature is an R&D lab with a 4.5 billion years learning curve that may have something to teach us about creating more sustainable materials, system, processes and organization. In this episode, we will talk about a project that comes from this same vision and focuses on the way we build manufacturing sites and companies. It's called Project Positive. And as we will see, it's not only a vision, but it's a group of change agents dedicated to raising the bar on what acting sustainably means, driven by a sense of urgency to move beyond arbitrary reduction goals to science-based targets and actions that are generous to the ecosystem, employees and communities in which they operate. And it all started from a vision by Janine Benius. When a city or a manufacturing site is functionally indistinguishable from the forest or wildlands next door, we have reached true sustainability. With Nicole of Biomimicry 3.8, we will discover the connection between biomimicry and Project Positive. We will hear about the companies involved and how they are implementing this vision and ultimately we will discover how this can expand beyond individual factories to cities and larger communities. This is such an interesting episode that can inspire and any company to take their sustainability vision a step further by looking at the forest next door and the ecosystem services it offers. Curious? Let's discover more. Sustainability at Work is a podcast about sustainability in the workplace and in companies. My name is Samara and I've been working with sustainability for almost 10 years. Hello, welcome everybody to Sustainability at Work. Welcome, Nicole. I'm very happy to have you here because I think Project Positive is a great story to share in this podcast, uh, especially. So I'm just going to dive into this and I'm going to ask you if you can introduce yourself and then maybe the first step is understanding what biomimicry is. You bet. So, well, again, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. And my name is Nicole Miller. I'm the Managing Director at Biomimicry 3.8. And I have the privilege of leading this amazing organization founded by two incredible women. Janine Benyus and Dr. Dana Baumeister founded Biomimicry 3.8 almost 20 years ago after the book, Janine Benyus wrote her book, Biomimicry Inspired by Nature. So the company has evolved over the 20 years and uh, I joined as managing director about seven years ago. My background is not science, it's not biology. My background is business. And so really the lens that I kind of bring to the, to the conversation and really how I look at it is, how can we integrate biomimicry as a vehicle and tool to support business strategy goals and objectives and really how to help businesses understand the capabilities in which the kind of tools that biomimicry can bring to kind of enhance the capabilities of the company in terms of achieving its goals and objectives. So very much look at it from a business perspective, from a strategy perspective, and then just have the amazing privilege to work with such incredible biologists, engineers, architects, and so on from our team. But that's a little bit about who I am, and I've learned so much along the way, and it's, it's really been a pleasure to be part of this company and to, and to be kind of on this growth trajectory that, that we're on. We're going into the business point of view of this story very shortly, but first, if you can make an introduction about what biomimicry is. Yeah. So biomimicry, so the way that Janine defined it in her book was the conscious emulation of nature's genius, right? And those words were chosen very carefully. And really what that's, what that means is that we're looking at what we can learn from nature, not necessarily about nature, right? And from a business perspective, it's not, you know, what can we extract from nature, but what can we learn from nature, right? So it's emulating the 3.8 billion years of R&D in nature, taking all those strategies, those lessons, those time-tested patterns and ideas and concepts that, that were created over time, really looking into those to help solve current day 
challenges, right? So it's looking at, you know, polar bears and polar bear skin and fur to understand thermoregulation and what we might learn from the polar bear when we're designing jackets that need to insulate better, right? Or it's looking at termite mounds and understanding how termite mounds regulate cooling without any sort of pumps and fans, right? In the middle of the desert, right? That they can keep the inside cool. How do they do that? And can we emulate that concept when we're building and designing new buildings, right? And, and then even looking at it from a broader context in terms of, of at a city level, you know, how can we design our cities to kind of emulate performance of, of local ecosystems, right? And I know we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I think what's one thing that's to kind of really understand biomimicry is one, it's learning from nature versus about and then it's looking at the different levels of which we can apply that, whether we're looking to emulate the form of the biology, the process, or the function, right? So there's multiple ways in which we can unpack all those lessons from nature. And there's multiple ways in which we can apply them, right? Like biomimicry is, is industry agnostic. We can apply it to the built environment. We can apply it to consumer products. We can apply it to organizational design. So it's really broad in terms of how it can be used as a tool. And we have a whole design lens that we use, a whole process and methodology that we use in terms of how we, we go to the biology to help solve functional challenges. So there's a whole kind of rubric around, you know, how we do it. So maybe this is a little bit longer answer than you were looking for, but in terms of, of what it is, really that emulation of nature and then how we do it, there's a lot of different ways in which we, we approach that based on the industry and the challenge itself. A beautiful introduction, for sure. I, I really loved it. And I think it's going to be very, very helpful to understand where we are going. So Biomimicry started many years ago. When was the book by Janine? Janine wrote her book in 1997. Perfect. So it, it stays, yeah. I would say, it stays more in the scientific world for a while. And then how biomimicry, part of biomimicry gave birth to this idea of Project Positive. How did that yeah. evolution? Yeah. So a big piece of our work is around place and place-based design, right? So when you're designing a building or a city or a community, you, we, we want to do so in a way that is fit to place, right? So a way we do, that we create place-based designs is really looking at the local ecosystem, looking at the organisms. How do those organisms survive and thrive? What are the variables of this place that have made it either be successful or what has not succeeded in place, right? And so by looking at that, it helps us create resilient design that is fit to place. And so really ecosystems are an important informant, if you will, and the performance of those ecosystems and the organisms within those ecosystems are really incredible reference and data points and tools that we can use to understand how to create resilient and regenerative design. So that's been a big part of our place-based work, our built environment work. And in 2015, we had been having conversations with Interface, a longtime partner of ours, and, and we were talking about their, their sustainability goals and that they were about to reach their 2020 sustainability goals. And that they were really asking, well, well, what's next? Like, where do we go next? And so we were kind of building on this concept of, of place-based design and said, well, what would it look like if we kind of expanded the concept of sustainability beyond just, you know, products, but if we started looking at facilities and if we started looking at every kind of piece that, that was in interface of sphere of control, right? Like because so much of the impact is kind of outside the, the sphere of control of the actual company itself. It's like what the consumer does with the product or, you know, how someone interacts with, with the space. But within this context, we knew that, you know, Interface could control their, how they designed and built their facilities. And so this kind of notion of like, well, what if your factories function like the forest next door? What if the facility and the campus itself was indistinguishable from how it looked and operated? And so 
Janine really kind of launched this vision. And when she intentionally said functionally indistinguishable, what she was really saying is, you know, that our factories produce the same ecosystem services that the forest next door generate. So what does that mean? Ecosystem services are the benefits that humans get from nature for free, right? So this is clean air, this is clean water, right? By the trees that are creating clean air that are filtering water, the soil that is filtering rainwater and creating biodiversity. And so these are all these benefits that we get, right? And so we can measure that. We can measure and quantify those ecosystem services. And so we kind of started toying around with this idea of like, okay, well, if we can measure and quantify the ecosystem services that the forest generates, then that can be our target for how our facilities should perform. And that's our aspirational target that our facilities are functioning, delivering those ecosystem services like the forest next door. And interface being the, you know, forward thinking, progressive, you know, sustainability leader that they are, they said, yes, let's try it. Let's see what that looks like. So we piloted this concept in a few of their different facilities, one, one in Australia and one in LaGrange, Georgia, far from you. And what we quickly realized was the potential of this concept and idea, and not just from the facilities perspective, but from the engagement, the employee engagement, the community engagement. Like, I think when we very, very first started, it was, this would be a better design. But then as we got into it, we're like, oh, it's much bigger than this. This is, this is how we look at, you know, every land that we touch, we can heal, right? Like that's, you know, Janine says that. So our first pilots really started to kind of uncover the potential of this vision. And, you know, since then we've, we've been unpacking and exploring and testing and, and piloting it since, but that's kind of how it came to be was really taking our place-based work a step further into quantification modeling and and measuring that and using that as a, as a performance target and then designing for that. Can you take us through the steps? It could be the example could be interface, the pilot, or it could be any other that you've done after, but could you take us through the steps that you go through to understand, like identifying first and then measure, understand a little bit better yeah. the process? So we created a four step process to really kind of help simplify at the highest level, kind of the four key stages that we go through. And those are identify, quantify, create, and implement. And so what we go through in each of the stages, you know, identify is really understanding what matters to this place, what matters to the community, what matters to the local ecology, and what matters to the company that's driving this work or the organization or community or city so that we can start to matrix those values and understand what is it that matters and why so that we can lean into that when we're designing, coming up with design interventions that generate ecosystem services, we're doing so to address specific needs of that community. So, so step one is all about identifying. So we, we baseline the performance of the site itself. Uh, we're, we're understanding what we call the nature of place. So we're looking at, you know, what people care about, what species are there, the history of like how that land has been used. Has there been environmental degradation? Has there been, you know, what, like what, what has formed that place, right? So it's kind of a deep dive into place. It's really step one. And then step two is the quantify. And that's where we really get into understanding, well, how does the site perform and how does the local forest perform? And, and when we do that, then we can start to understand that performance gap, right? Between our, our site, our community and the forest. And once we understand that performance gap, then we, need, then we understand what we need to solve for, right? And then that's when we go into the create phase and that's where we get into our design interventions that are closing that performance gap and meeting that community need that we identified in step one. And then we go into implementation and that's when we go into looking at the design interventions that have the co-benefits needed to address the 
challenges, the, the community needs, uh, so on and so forth. So one of the, I think, the kind of key differentiators about this work is that we're not picking a single issue like stormwater management or waste management, right? We're looking at all the challenges holistically, and then we're looking at design interventions that will address them holistically. Uh, so these kind of multifunctional designs with, with co-benefits to, to kind of touch each one, right? So when we go into the implementation, what we're looking at is sometimes a prioritization of interventions that have the most co-benefits and figuring out the strategy for which we're going to integrate that. And then designing the strategy for how we're going to talk about that, how we're going to so much of the projects that we work on have a pretty strong influence on either that company or the the city in terms of that kind of social license to operate, you know, with, within that community. So a lot of what we talk about is understanding the value of these design interventions, what benefits they, they deliver to the community, and the story that, that we can really tell when we begin to implement these in terms of, you know, waters that, that were previously polluted now may become, you know, clean again. You can now, you know, swim and recreate in water that you couldn't before, or now the, the water is safe to drink, or, you know, we'll be able to improve air quality. So really so much of what we want to do is get the narrative right for our intended outcomes so that as we go to talk about this work, that it's really clear what our goals and objectives are and the benefits that the community will get and not just, you know, that community, but with the entire, you know, with what we call the service shed, right? So the ripple effect of that. So if we integrate, you know, pollinator habitats, for example, that doesn't just benefit that one street or that one house or that one building, right? It benefits that entire community and then there's ripple effect of, upon that. So we're able to map that to see what that looks like. So a big part of our implementation is really demonstrating where those benefits ripple uh, into so that people really understand the value of what we're trying to do. Do you have an example of the process with concrete example from the local environment you inspired from the nature solution, just to make an example, how they, how any company applied it and what was the results? Yeah, so actually one of my favorite projects is one of our very first that we kind of applied this thinking to before we did the, the quantification of ecosystem services. Uh, we've kind of always done this, you know, place-based work. And we did a project in the city for the city of La Vasa. And this was a project that we did with one of our design partners, HOK. And the goal of the, of the landscape master plan was to provide guidance to create a resilient landscape that celebrates La Vasa as a, as a place of the Sahadri region's biodiversity and character, right? We really wanted to kind of honor that. And the intent of the project was to preserve, restore, and enhance uh, the natural and built environment of, of that site. And so we really worked with the team to help them understand the role of the native forest ecosystems, the role that they play in the water and soil cycles of that region, because this area experienced intense monsoon, so about 27 feet of rainfall in three months, right? So intense rain. And to identify the species in the region that would best inform kind of resilient and, and sustainable design. So through that, we, we looked at kind of some of the key issues that were facing this particular project. So construction waste, disposal of excavated soil, soil erosion, water leakage, water use, and minimizing wastewater, uh, recharging groundwater, and alternative energy sources. So these were kind of some of the key things that we were looking at. All sorts of different species, right, that had information for us to understand how do these species navigate this abundance of water, and, and how do they manage that? And that really helped give us design strategies that we could then think about in that design process, right? So for example, when we were looking at the stormwater, the management of that water flow, one of the things that we really started to look at is how can we 
create design in, in the landscape itself that would slow the water, the water runoff. And so kind of two kind of key things that we looked at were, were canna canopy drops. So from the tree canopy itself, which dissipates kinetic energy of falling water, right? The tree canopy has that process in it. And then drip tips off leaves, right? Like how they, how they shed excessive water quickly. So looking at these kind of two different design strategies, if you will, from the leaves themselves from trees, as well as kind of the tree canopy and how they did that, and how could we actually use that to inform better landscape design to, to kind of help disperse that water on the site. And so ultimately what, what that landed on is we helped by kind of taking all these species and by taking all these approaches, we really helped kind of create a systems level approach to help them rethink water storage in a new way by presenting, you know, this kind of multiple uh, patterns and strategies about how these local plants and animals managed evaporation. And these design concepts really is what enabled HOK to make more informed and innovative design decisions that led to successful uh, site design and, and master planning process. And ultimately what this yielded was a design that had 70% of the previously deforested land will be restored through kind of detailed landscaping and restoration of the slope greening. There was a 30% reduction in carbon emissions, a 65% reduction in potable water consumption, and a 95% reduction in waste sent to landfill. So by looking again at things kind of systems and holistically in all these kind of different parts, understanding how the local species did that, we're able to come up with a better design master plan. Amazing. So who are the companies involved? Because I love that Project Positive is putting together a really a group of people and, and companies. And how do you work all together and, and who are the companies involved, both from the design standpoint and the, and the company, the corporate? So when we launched this work with Interface, what we quickly realized is that there was an opportunity to bring those who are doing this work together to share best practices. And so that's when we really created Project Positive as a collective of companies that were really looking to kind of change the conversation of sustainability, like, you know, beyond moving beyond less bad and specifically into how do we generate positive impact? How do we act regeneratively? And what we talked about is that, you know, when we were first doing this work, we had, you know, company A, company B, and company, and they were all doing kind of their own work. And I think at the same time, we all realized, like, this is going to go a lot faster if you all start talking and if we can all start sharing stories. And I think everyone agreed, like, yeah, like we're not in this for ourselves, like we're in this for a greater good. And so we can strip out the, you know, the proprietary information and talk about things collectively to really help one another advance their efforts. And what we found so much of the value in this is hearing how, you know, the other companies shared the information. So right now part of you know so interface and, and google and microsoft ford aquafil logoplast jacobs are really kind of our key members right now i'm probably forgetting someone and so what we wanted to do is to really make sure that the information could be shared in an in a way that was in a safe space you know that that they could talk about their work but that they could also kind of share resources. I mean, so much of what we found is like, hey, how did you get your, you know, president of your company to sign off on this? Or how did you, how did you embed this into your entire strategy for your organization? And so sharing those stories is what we found to be super helpful for one another because everyone operates in such rapid, you know, fast moving environments with limited capacity and huge demands, you know, so like we all have a lot of these similar operating conditions. So what can we learn from one another so that we can be more effective in being really crisp on the value prop or being 
really clear about, hey, this really worked well for us when we were developing our strategy or, hey, when we did this pilot, we realized that we needed to look at external and internal operating conditions. And here's how we did that. So Project Positive is really that place where companies who are committed to doing this work, using nature as a design inspiration and using ecosystem services as a performance goal to, to really kind of share and collaborate ideas. And so that's kind of the purpose of, of Project Positive. And, and what we found is that, you know, th this is science-based work, it's data-driven work, and, and that's what really resonates with a lot of companies is that we're not just talking about regenerative, but we're talking about regenerative, you know, in a way that, I mean, we could probably argue that nature is probably the best model for regenerative, but we could probably also argue that it's the only proven pathway for regenerative. So these are kind of companies that are, that understand that and are interested and engaged in using that as a strategy for achieving their regenerative goals. So how do you get the CEO to sign the project? This is an interesting part, especially for this podcast. I'm really interested in solutions, but then how those solutions are implemented inside a, a company. I think that's almost the hardest part because kind yeah. of the solution are there and we know what they are but sometimes it's very difficult to go through the whole process inside the company. So what did you learn? I understand for sure metrics, but do you have a other suggestion on that? Yeah, I think a couple of things that are key for this to be successful. One, I think anytime you have to tie it to what the company already cares about, right? So that's what we were talking about in the beginning, like really understanding the goals and objectives and, you know, maybe that's the SDGs and it's relating it back to that, or maybe there's a, a carbon goal or a waste goal or whatever that is. So we always want to make sure that we're coming in and demonstrating how this is in service to what the company is already committed to and then how it can then go beyond. So it's kind of like the yes and. Yes, we can achieve your carbon goal. And by the way, we can generate biodiversity. We can generate clean water. We can you know generate soil. So so that's kind of the first thing is understanding what matters and to demonstrate how this work is going to be in service to those goals. And then the other thing that we learned through work with Lee Sharp at Harvard School of, of Public Health is that for, for innovation, particularly sustainable regenerative innovation to really be adopted there's some kind of key moves that you have to make. And, you know, one is, is this kind of idea of code switching, right? This matching signal to antenna, right? And that's kind of what a little bit I was talking about, like under, like really understand what matters to that person or to that company and really speak that language. So that's kind of the first piece of it. And then the second is getting a pilot, just demonstrating something at a small scale to show this is what's possible. And here's what we did at a pilot level. And then, you know, extrapolate that out so that they could really see in a very tangible way, oh, if we were to apply this more broadly, this is what it could look like. And here's what we did with our pilot. And like with Interface, for example, one of the things we would have never imagined, I mean, we knew that the work was engaging at a community level and that there was a potential kind of bridge to community, but the employee engagement was something we didn't anticipate being as responsive as it was. And really it was the employees at the, at the first facilities that we, that we did that was driving it. They were like, Hey, what's going on with this? What's happening with this project? Who, you know, what's the next step? And they were really moving it because they were so excited to, bring this information about this place that they love, right? Like everyone who lives in that community has some sort of relationship with the nature of that community, right? And so by bringing that into our process, it really got them excited about the work. And, and you know, Aaron Mizan of Interface will say, like, they had to admit, like, even after all the sustainability work that they did, like, they still had hot dark factories, right? And they wanted to solve for that. And so the employees were really excited about it. So I think that pilot 
to come back to that is kind of like the kind of other key factor. That's what we really learned in the pilot, right? And she was then able to say, okay, if we do this at all of our facilities, this is the type of engagement we, we get. And then she can loop in the HR people. She can loop in the operations people to say like, here's how we're gonna you know, meet these goals and objectives. So that's the power of the pilot is to really kind of get those key kind of out, outputs that then talk about how, how you'd move forward at larger scale. So to your question, how do you sell the CEO? It's, it, you know, I think those are kind of the two key things we've learned is it's got to align with strategy. We've got to be able to demonstrate how it supports and builds on strategy. And then we've got to have a pilot to, to kind of back that up. And do you have any suggestion on the, on the team that should be at the table? From your side, of course, but from the corporate side, should be the CEO at the table deciding at first steps or should come from down up? Who needs to be there? Technical people who speak technical stuff, communication people, who sustainability people? Yeah, you know, I think we found it with our work, it's come at all different entry points. You know, we've had CEOs say, I want to do this and have really driven it. And then we've also had the sustainability teams really say, we need to do this. We've also had the innovation teams drive this. So I think in short answer to your question, we want to have as many people around the table as we can. Marketing, communications, sustainability, you know, SVPs, like we want them all there at the table. But typically it's 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 one of those teams that's going to introduce it, right? And be the and be the kind of spearhead of of making it happen. And so much of what we try to do is then give them the information and and like and this is where project positive is so powerful, is then to bring those peers in to then have those conversations. So it's not just us saying it, but it's other companies saying, hey, we've done this, you know, so like if a marketing and communications team, you know, is really excited about this, then they can say, okay, well, you know, here's someone from Ford that can talk to Microsoft, you know, about that. So, so yeah, kind of a long answer to your question. It can be any, I think the key is getting that buy-in in an effect effective way and understanding the stakeholders and what what they need because every company's culture is a little bit different in terms of how they need to communicate it how they need to present it to leadership um, and that's where really those stories from those peer organizations become really powerful and in, in helping to to kind of present that so yeah but ideally as many people as we can get at the table and 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 that's what we have found is that once the team brings it in people quickly get excited because they see the potential, you know, like the marketing team easily gets excited, you know, the innovation team gets excited and the, the corporate affairs people get excited. So if we can get the narrative right, then the buy-in internally isn't a significant lift, right? I think everyone sees the value pretty quickly. So looking broader, how does all these concepts apply to cities? Because I guess Janine's mm. first idea was about cities and then it went more on manufacturing side. But, the, but I remember her first her quote was, when a city or a manufacturing site is functionally indistinguishable from the forest or the wildland next door, we've reached through sustainability. So she started mm -hmm. from the cities. Is this applied to any cities today? Are you working with any? Yeah. So we, we have done the work with cities. We did the work with the city of Amsterdam. And I'll talk about that specifically, but then I'll also talk about, so I think one thing that, that companies quickly realize and even a city is that, you know, if a company were to do this at a campus level, right? And they were to look at a building and then their campus, like, yes, there's, there's impact there. But the bigger opportunity is when you start to scale this at the district level, at the community level, at the city level, at the state level, right? Like it just gets, keeps growing bigger and bigger. So what our you know, vision is for this is that the performance metrics of each community are available, right? For anyone, like this is the aspirational target for any particular community in terms of how much soil you should generate, how much carbon you should sequester, how much biodiversity you should create, right? Like, so those performance metrics are available and that 
when you're designing or you're building or you're creating that you're you're doing so with those kind of goals in in mind and so anyone that all of our project positive members are really looking at yes we want to do this for our site but we want then to be the exemplar in the community that shows this is how we did it and how could our neighbor do it and how could our employees do it and how could our schools do it and how you know so the idea is not just to kind of end at the site but that's the starting point for that community so that's kind of you know objective number one is at a company level the impact is much broader than the site itself when we look at the city level one of the things that we want to do is to really understand the the impact of that city and where those impacts lie so that we can start to design in a way again that's holistic right like a, a city is a complicated system a comprehensive system right so really understanding the bits and pieces and parts and so with the amsterdam project we did that in collaboration with c40 which is a organization of the cities it's top 40 cities uh population wise uh in the world and really looking at how they're addressing sustainability circular economy so it was really led by them and uh in partnership with kate rayworth from Donut Economics and her organization, the, the Donut Economics Action Lab. And so from they were looking at it from that kind of circularity holistic level of like, what are all the inputs and outputs of the city and, and what is Amsterdam's bigger impact? What are the social dynamics in play? And where we came in was to really look at, there were kind of four main lenses to the project and that was local ecological and local social impacts and then global ecological and social impacts. So looking at the role that Amsterdam played in, in all of those. And so what we help to kind of bring to the table is how are those local ecosystems performing and what should Amsterdam be kind of setting at its targets as it's looking at these social and ecological dynamics. And it really became a tool to think about design for the city in a, in a much more, not just like building design, but how it runs its organizations in terms of how it's supporting its, its citizens, its, its communities. So with, with the integration or bringing this kind of lens into Kate Rayworth's kind of design framework, it was really de developed as a, and labeled as a city selfie Right. So if you were to take a selfie of yourself to say, how do I look? That's kind of became out the output of that, the outcome of that project. And now it's actually a framework that you can download. Cities can download and do their own city selfie of how are they performing at that kind of at the in those four quadrants of a performance. So it was a, it was an awesome project, uh, one that has got a lot of exposure in terms of how do we build back better after COVID and how do we, how do we design more resilient cities that are integrating biodiversity in a way that's healthy for the ecosystem and healthy for human health and well-being. So, so yeah, it might have been a longer answer than you are looking for, but, no, no. but yeah, that was the work with Amsterdam. And, and I think what we found which and what is a great I think example out of that project is again the multifunctionality of how we can apply this thinking to to different frameworks that are already in existence. Great, I love especially the connection you need between corporation and and then the cities because I think that's the really the innovation of this project to see broader than, the, the, than yeah. just the facility. I really always wanted to ask you, what is your favorite nature-inspired solution? I think one that, that I talk about a lot because I think it's so cool is the project that we did with HOK for the U.S. Coast Guard, which is a building that was built into on a hillside and so when you approach the building it looks like two stories but it's really 11 stories built into the hillside and it goes down but it's it's the series of interconnected green rooftops that you see so as you as you enter the building 
you see these two levels, but then as you look out, all you're seeing is this beautiful landscape because each layer is, each building is a, is a layer below you. So you're just seeing the rooftop, right? So it's this incredible design of, from a landscape perspective, but also aesthetically, and then what it's actually doing in terms of a performance level. So I love that example because it shows at scale. It's not, you know, just like a cool widget or a cool product. I mean, there's so many, Samara, it's like honestly asking like, what's your favorite child? So that's a difficult one, but I do like that example because it, it helps people see it at scale. Um, and that tiered rooftop system was inspired by beaver dams and how beaver dams build to filter water in sequencing in those dams. And so that was kind of the design inspiration, but so much kind of evolved as that project ideation was happening. I would say that's one, but I'm, as soon as I'm going to close my mouth on this, like four others are going to come up and be like, that's so cool. So, so that's my answer for this exact moment in time. No, that, that's a good one. So last question, what keeps your fuel going and what energizes you in these days? I think just the potential of this work, right? That we're thinking about design differently. And I love the I love, you know, that, that we're, you know, one of the core sayings of, of biomimicry is that we're creating conditions conducive to life, right? Like we're designing facilities that support all life, right? Not just human life, but, but all life, right? And I think that notion of, of realizing that, of creating products or communities or facilities that create positive impact and that we as humans can do so much more right than what we're doing we have so much more potential to have a much more positive relationship with our planet and i think that's what inspires me and keeps me going is that that potential of what that looks like janine does this really beautiful talk where she shows the 1940s world fair and how you know there was this exhibit where everyone was sitting around looking at the cities of the future and there were high rises and these complicated interrelated you know highway systems and it was like wow like imagine that and then we did it right we built it we created it and now we're looking at all this thing like huh <laughs> maybe this wasn't the best idea but now we can start to create cities that are full of of, of tr buildings with trees, you know, sprouting out of them and, and communities where the, the parks and the buildings and are, are all interconnected. And I think that vision of what that looks like and to your point, like we need an image like biomimicry and the power of biomimicry is so visual, right? It's, it's to see all that we can do. And, and so for me, having those visuals of what we're creating and what we're supporting right? Like you take a walk out in nature and you, you know, one handful of dirt has, you know, how many millions of organisms, billions of organisms in it, right? This is like thinking that we're now creating designs that are in service to all of that and not a detriment. Like to me, that, that's just so inspiring. And to, to see some of the examples of what that looks like is what fuels me for sure just our human potential is so much more and I'm, I'm I'm excited that we're on the brink of tapping into that in a in a positive way I think we couldn't have a better note to end this thank you Nicole and keep up with the good work because it's amazing the work you're doing oh thank you so much thank you Nicole bye thank you for listening to this episode of sustainability at work if you like this episode, please consider rating and sharing it. It will help others to discover it, and the more we are learning about sustainability, the better. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Sustainability at Work is a series created together with Traces and Dreams, a collective platform to tell the story of our times and connect the dots by embracing complexity and a diversity of views and ideas. See you next time!